in what is a very significant time. When we look at the world that we currently live in, if we look at the conflicts that are happening right now, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Israel and Gaza, uh, there's some significant world events happening at the moment in the time that we live in. And there's lots of things happening culturally. Uh, many commentators think that we're at the end of what was known as like the American century, where America was the biggest political power around the world. Now we've got the rise of China. Uh, we've got the centers of power changing. The centers of population are changing. Uh, there's lots of things happening culturally, which mean that we live in a really significant time. And many people have described this time that we're in as almost like the in-between two different eras in history. There was an era that was before, there's an era that's coming, and we're kind of in this little bit in-between where people don't really know what that looks like. I want, over the next couple of weeks, just to spend some time exploring what kind of church do we need to be in the context in which we live, in the world in which we live. And as I mentioned, there's lots of stuff happening in our world culturally at the moment, whether it's the the impact that the internet has made on the world. This is seen as the greatest technological shift in the last 500 years, at least, since the printing press. We've got all this AI talk that's going on at the moment. Um, But also I want us to, to zoom in a little bit and think about what's happening with Christianity and faith in the world at the moment. Now, over the past few decades, church attendance in the West has declined. The church no longer holds that place of influence that it once did. And then 20 years ago, we had things like the birth of the new atheist movement, which kicked off around 9-11 where all these kind of, uh, you might have heard of the Richard Dawkins and all these people came through proclaiming that God was dead, that, um, that, that faith was no longer reasonable in our world. Now, while um, that has completely fallen apart, uh, the new atheist movement is kind of no longer a thing, and most of their claims were greatly overstated, the impact was still felt culturally. Here in Scotland, thinking about the church here in Scotland, it's been predicted that as many as 700 churches are due to close by the end of this decade. 700 churches are predicted, not saying they will, predicted to close by the end of this decade. So this is a serious time of shaking for the church as we think about the church in the West. And a number of commentators and historians, as well as remarking on all these other kind of cultural things that happen, global events, etc., comment that this season has been the end of Christendom. Christendom is this term that's used to describe this period of time where Christianity had political power, where Christianity dominated in Europe and America with power. It was tied in with government and it was tied in with monarchy. So most of us have lived through an era where we've watched that decline. Christendom has come to an end. Something that's perhaps lasted 1,500 years has come to an end and is coming to an end. Now, for many people, that feels like a real sense of loss. How are we supposed to cope with that loss? And for some people, they do need to grieve the loss that's felt there, to say goodbye to what was. However, I want to stand before you today and say that I'm extremely confident for the church of the future. I'm confident this could actually be one of the greatest moments for the church that we're living in. Hebrews 12 says this, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, Let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So the church, uh, the community of people who follow Jesus, has always thrived in difficult times. The passing of Christendom puts our faith back in the place where it's always spread like wildfire, right out on the margins. And in contrast, some of the absolute worst moments of church history have been when the church has had all the power. 
Now, we live in that time which has been described as kind of that changing of era, that, that in-between time. And the problem with in-between times is they're, they're deeply uncomfortable. Do you know when you, you go to, to, if you try to jump over a river, and that point where you're kind of past the point of no return, but you're not quite sure you're going to make it to the other side. That's what it's like to be in between two eras. So that's why our world feels uncertain, confusing, why anxiety is on the rise, and all of these cultural things that are happening right now, because there's confusion. Given that context, I want to explore some different ways that we as the church can be confident, but also things that I believe God wants to emphasize for us in this season. And since Christmas is upon us, I thought I would actually use a Christmas passage to help us unpack this. So we're going to be looking at a prophecy from Isaiah, chapter 9. Uh, verses 6 to 7. Now, this is a passage that's often looked at at this time of year. Um, Isaiah is one of the great prophets in the Old Testament. He lived from somewhere between 800 BC and 700 BC. Uh, He spoke into a world of kings, often critiquing nations, always calling the people of Israel and Judah back to God. But he also spoke of this coming king, one who was going to restore the fortunes of Israel and Judah and even the whole world. So let's read these verses from Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So Isaiah speaks out this prophecy And it was 1,300 years before Jesus would come after this to fulfill this prophecy. Coming to us, God in the flesh, coming as a helpless baby. And I want to pick out just a few things from these verses. But today, I really just want to focus on one main idea. And that's this idea that Jesus came to establish a kingdom. It says, for us, a child is born... To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And later it says, uh, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Now, government's a a, a funny word. Um, Thank goodness, without being political, that, that Jesus isn't coming to bring the kind of government that we have. That's not what it means here when he talks about government. He's talking about kingdom. He's talking about Jesus coming as a king to reign and rule. And these are the words that are fulfilled when Jesus arrives onto the earth. Yet he comes as a king and dignitaries travel from afar and and they bring gifts like a king at a royal birth. And every king has a kingdom. The primary message when Jesus came um, and started preaching was that the kingdom is here. Matthew refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. The other gospels and other places, uh, the kingdom of God. They both mean the same thing. Mark's gospel opens with these verses here. uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Sometimes I uh, have these thoughts and uh, sometimes I keep them to myself, but one of the questions I always have is, why, why is the primary message that many churches deliver look so differently to the message that Jesus delivered? The primary message that Jesus delivered was that the kingdom of God is here, repent and believe. And that is the good news. I think we sometimes get ourselves into trouble when we take other things that are just as true and make them the primary message. We take part of the picture and make it into the whole picture. See, the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. 
When we talk about the good news we have, and if we don't refer to the kingdom, we're, we're sharing a slightly different view on it than Jesus had. We need to see things within their wider framework. So for example, forgiveness of sins is, of course, part of the gospel. But so often it's the only message that is proclaimed. Forgiveness of sins is what happens when we turn back to God so that we can step into the kingdom and become kingdom ambassadors. The kingdom of God should be our main good news. So I want to know, we've talked briefly just about this idea of kingdom, God's rule, God's reign, but where does the church fit into this? Where does church and kingdom fit together? Well, the word church uh, that we use today is one of these words that has morphed and changed over time. So what it means to us today when we say the word church isn't exactly what it was meant uh, go back uh, hundreds of years. It meant something different. And the usage in the New Testament is the Greek word, which you've maybe heard, the Greek word ecclesia. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. Somebody can correct me later. But it was a word that was already in usage at the time of Jesus. It, what I love about the, the way that God works through the Bible is that so often he takes terms that are in the culture and then he reuses them for his purposes. And ecclesia is one of those words. Now, when one of the very first English translations of the Bible was done by William Tyndale, and when he came to translate this word, he used the word congregation to, uh, to, to translate, those who congregate. But unfortunately, this really upset the religious and political powers of the day. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church felt like by calling it a congregation, it was challenging all the power structures that they had built up over time. And this sadly eventually led to Tyndale's death just by translating this word uh, ecclesia as congregation. With the King James Bible, which again is a Bible that is slightly wrapped up in the politics of its day, uh, the word uh, gets changed to church. Now this comes from the German word kirke, uh, uh, or the word we get Scottish kirk, which simply means off the Lord. Church meaning off the Lord. And over time, church became synonymous with this institution that we call church. And it also became in, uh, kind of tied up with these buildings that we call churches. Over time, you can see this word has gradually shifted and changed. So going back to the original Greek, the word means those that are called out. The original usage of the word was used for those, a, a gathering or an assembly of people into a public space. And it was used at the time to refer to local democratic gatherings uh, for the purposes of decision-making, policy, and governance. It was sometimes also used as a form of court now, when Jesus used this term to describe this new family that he was birthing, he was using this as his frame of reference. People called out, gathered and assembled with a purpose of governing. Jesus would build an assembly. He would call people together to unite for a purpose. Not in some sort of political sense, not for the kingdom of Caesar of his day, but for the kingdom of God. This could not be further from what actually comes to mind when we think about the word church today. And that's why we have to sometimes do a little bit of work to unpack what church really means. So often, you know, we'll, we say like, you know, the church is, not, is the people, not the building. But also we need to see that the church is those who are called together to, to govern the reign of God's kingdom, to govern with God. The church is the vehicle by which God brings his kingdom. But in terms of how we think about the, the word church today, God's kingdom is so much bigger than church. You see, God's desire is to impact the whole planet, not to fill church buildings on a Sunday. He wants to impact everywhere 
And, and we know the prophecies that the, that the glory of the Lord will fill the earth like the waters cover the seas. We know these words. He wants to impact every area of society, every area of culture, every person, not just filling uh, uh, seats on a Sunday. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And in a time where many church institutions are struggling, I think this is why it's really important that our emphasis stays on the bigger picture, God's kingdom. And unfortunately, all church congregations do have a tendency to look inward. And I'm sure that we're not immune from that here. We can all get so busy doing church that we forget that our emphasis is to bring the kingdom. If churches exist purely to sustain their own activities, then something has gone missing. There's of course nothing wrong with church activities. I believe gathering together is that habit that forms us and shapes us and encourages us in the Lord to seek the Lord together. But our, our reason for existing can't simply be to gather. Our reason for existing has to be something bigger. Our mission as a church is to see God's kingdom established in East Lothian and beyond. And our vision for how we do that is to be a Jesus-centered family, both living out and giving out hope. We need to lift up our eyes, up and out, not inwards and down. We are called to work with God in the establishing of his kingdom. So, what do we mean by establishing the kingdom of God? Now, as, a, as we've discussed, it means, of course, God's rule and reign on the earth. And uh, you'll be aware that, obviously, the Lord's prayer, it, he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, these are really big ideas that sometimes we struggle to unpack. But we need to kind of stop and think about it in detail, because what does it mean when God's kingdom comes to earth? We need to start thinking hard about this question. We might think it means that people start living moral lives or that everyone starts choosing to follow Jesus. And, and these are our, our great starters for what the kingdom of God looks like. But it's actually much broader than that, much bigger, but also much smaller. As well as these kind of overtly spiritual pursuits, it's seen in beauty. It's seen in art. It's in composing a symphony, painting a picture, writing a small message of encouragement to a friend. It's in designing buildings that are functional for their use. It's seen in pruning the roses in your garden. It's in finding joy in a sunset. It's picking up litter on the beach. It's chatting to a lonely neighbor, and it's in giving someone your last Rolo. It's in seeing the healings and the miracles as we pray, but it's also in comforting people in their loss. It's in playing music skillfully and in repairing a car. It's in serving people as an accountant and working at a call center and being generally helpful. It's freeing people from spiritual oppression in their lives and helping people out of poverty. It's having our security not in our wealth and our possessions, but in God alone. It's making earth that little bit more like heaven. More joy, more peace, more love, more health, more freedom, more justice, more of God invited into our world. And it's inviting people to know the source of that kingdom. And that is the good news that we have. So just two aspects from our, our verses today um, that, that come up about our kingdom, uh, what the kingdom means. And the first is this, that the kingdom of God is first and foremost relational. The verses that we read earlier, a, a child is born, a son is given, and it says an everlasting father. 
So this kingdom, when we think about the kingdom of God, the first thing we need to realize is that that kingdom is a relational kingdom. There are kingdoms that are not relational. There are kingdoms that impose power on people. But the kind of kingdom that God is bringing is a deeply relational kingdom. It's it's built by sacrificial love. It's not built by telling other people how to live their lives or what to do. Not by asserting power, but by giving up power. Matthew 25, 25, uh, Jesus said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise over them. Not so with you. The kingdom of God is different. It comes in low to serve, to love people. God's kingdom is always established through the character of love. The kingdom of God is never about enforcing stuff on people, but it's always about coming low and serving people. So the first thing about this kingdom is this kingdom is relational. The second thing is that this kingdom is always growing. This is, this is just to encourage you today. You can look at the church statistics, you can see all of that thing, but there's a biblical truth that God's kingdom is actually always growing. It's always growing. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. This is uh, covered in other places. Uh, when we want to understand the kingdom, we've of course got the parables that Jesus taught. Lots of the parables are to help us get pictures of what the kingdom of God is like. And one of them in Mark chapter 4, it says this. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. That parable is wonderful to me because it's like, it's like we're sowing seed and we don't really always know what's happening with it. But it's sent, that, that parable encourages us that the kingdom of God is always sprouting and always growing. God's kingdom is always growing and always sprouting. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. So whatever it looks like in our world, you can be sure God's kingdom is on the increase. Now, this kingdom is our primary message and our primary mission, I think, is so important for us uh, to understand as a church because God wants to do something that's bigger than, than what we can gather in a room here on a Sunday or in small groups. He wants to do something bigger than all of that, bigger than any of us. And of course, we need to think bigger than just our church. We have brothers and sisters here in North Berwick and across East Lothian who are also seeking after the kingdom of God. This is not a time for disunity between churches. This is a time for us to really be united behind the mission of Jesus. Now, I often think that um, if some of the early followers of Jesus showed up in our time, some of the church structures and governance and the thousands of denominations we have would look so strange to the people from the early church, wouldn't they? The way that we divide and we separate, the way that we uh, think about things, the way we structure ourselves. And, and it's not all bad, but it's just, it can get in the way of us being the people God calls us to be. God's kingdom is bigger than any of our own particular theology, uh, our own particular styles, and our own particular structures. Our, our purposes as a church are more, more than just meeting Sunday and keeping that going for as long as we can do it. The future church, the church that needs to exist in this era, is the church that seeks after the kingdom of God, which looks to make an impact on our planet. This is not a time for self-preservation, for protecting what we already have. This is a time for being prepared to take risks, to take steps of faith, that God might move. We are a gathered people called out by God to be his kingdom ambassadors. 
And yes, we gather on Sundays and in small groups to be equipped with good works, to be sent out. This should be a launching station, not a holy huddle hiding from the world. This is the launching station that each of us could be kingdom bearers. And I just want to give us one really practical way that's going to help us think about you and me bringing the kingdom of God in our lives. And it's through this very simple word. The word is vocation. Vocation. It just means like the kind of purpose that we bring to work, the call to work. Now, when we often think about our eternal future with God, we think about heaven perhaps, we often think about lounging around doing absolutely nothing. Is it just me that thinks like that? We think, oh, it's going to be so great. We can just get the deck chairs out and uh, it's just going to be like the perfect retirement. However, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but the, the picture we actually have of our future with God is very different to that. Actually, the biblical picture is you've got work to do in eternity. When we go to be with Jesus and when he creates the new heavens and the new earth, guess what? It says that we rule and reign with him. There's going to be work to do in heaven. There's going to be things to do. There's going to be purposes. Our future is, is, to, is to rule with God. And we need to think about work through a biblical lens, not the kind of cultural lens, which is basically work as little as you possibly can and then take as much time off at the end of your life as you possibly can um, to compensate for how bad work was. I'm exaggerating slightly, but often that is the cultural view of work. Work in a biblical lens is seen as, as a good thing. Being productive is a healthy part of what it means to be human. Think back to the garden when, when God called Adam and Eve to, to, to tend to the land, to be fruitful and multiply, to, to take dominion, to subdue, it says, which is actually more like to cultivate. It's a picture of cultivating this garden that God has given us. And that's what work is supposed to be. Uh, obviously, we tend to think work more negatively and it sounds exhausting, but work in eternity will be both meaningful and restful. So you can, be, you can rest in, assured in that. So if we want to think about God's kingdom, we need to think about this idea of vocation, how we spend our time. On average, people spend a third of their lives working. And I think the other third is, one third is sleeping, and then a third doing something else, scrolling on social media, watching TV, uh, or whatever it is. But we spend a third of our, our, our lives working in some form. Now, we can either see that third of our lives as something spiritual in which God is working in and through us, or we can completely separate it out from our spiritual lives. For those of you in the room that are still working, the question today is, do you see your job as a kingdom pursuit? Now, unfortunately, most of us are trained into this kind of Greek way of thinking where we separate out areas of our lives and we say, these bits are God's and these bits are mine and uh, these bits over here are, are, are kind of holy to God and these bits are just normal. This is not a biblical view of, of, of our work. We've created this kind of sacred, secular divide in our minds and in our hearts. Some things are God's and some things are not. Of course, being a, a pastor is a deeply sacred job. But being a secretary, no, that's just, that's just a secular thing. Of course, I'm joking. These are the kind of things, though, that we play around with in our heads. Everything can be sacred for God. Everything can be holy. And Vivian spoke to us uh, recently about the, the holiness of God. Uh, and the idea of holiness is, is to be set apart. To be set apart, to be distinct, unique. Things in the temple were made holy because they were set apart for God's use only. What if you took your working life and you set it apart for God and said, God, this is holy to you. This is holy to you. 
If you work in admin, go and be an admin for God. If you work in a shop, serve God in your shop. You might not have your ideal job. It it may be deeply frustrating uh, that God has you there, but God will use you there. There is no sacred secular divide, only what we dedicate to God. If the whole earth is going to be full of the glory of God, we might as well start by opening up our minds to the ways that God can use our vocation for the kingdom. And sometimes as a church, sadly, we can feed into this idea of separation. Uh, Whenever there's a, a missionary being sent out to deepest, darkest Africa to proclaim the gospel, we bring them up the front and we pray for them and we send them out in the power of the Spirit. But what about when there's somebody taking on a new business venture? Or there's a business leader taking on a new assignment that they believe God is calling them to. What if we called them to the front and we prayed God's spirit over them and we prayed God's blessing over them? What if we released everyone to be missionaries in their own lives? What if everyone in this room felt commissioned to go and bring the kingdom through what God's called them to? I really love this quote from uh, Dorothy Sayers writes this. Uh, She's written about work and and it says this, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter, carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. I really like that because I'm like, we separate out these spiritualized, but I believe by getting a proper understanding of vocation, we give it all to God and we do it with excellence. We serve him. You can serve God by doing a great job in your job. And for those of you who are retired, you're not off the hook. Apart from the fact that retirement is actually a fairly modern invention that we created just to uh, create more jobs for people, Um, that aside, in this season of your life, you are still called to be productive. It's not, there's no retirement in the kingdom of God, sorry. There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. You're still called to be productive for the kingdom. Now, it may look different, But don't get me wrong, you still have a lot to contribute. You also have the benefit of looking back at the threads of your life and seeing how God has been bringing in skills and and things into your life that you can now use for God's kingdom. You may even find yourself with more free time to do the things that God calls you into. It doesn't look the same for everyone, but it may come through your relationships or in your family or serving in community groups or supporting a care home, writing a book, planting a garden or praying in your home. All of these are kingdom pursuits. You may feel more limited, but the good news is God is not limited by your limitations. All of us together get to play a role in the kingdom of God. I love this verse from uh, Colossians 3, 23. It says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And that's the heartbeat of what I'm trying to say. When we get a proper understanding of vocation to see that our jobs, the things we do, the, the productive work we do are all for God then we can make a kingdom impact. The kingdom of God is bigger than just praying for the sick, although it includes that. It's it's bigger than just leading people to salvation, which of course it includes. The kingdom of God takes many forms and it's seen in your creative, productive work. Whatever your circumstances, we need to get that true sense of vocation to discover God's kingdom purposes in our life. Today, give God your productivity. Now, we began with Isaiah's prophecy about the the coming Christ. Let me just read those words again for us. For us, a child is born. 
To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from, the time, from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, Jesus, in fulfillment of these words in the Sermon on the Mount, which we looked at, I think it was last year, um, in Matthew 6, 33, says this, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Some translations say, seek the kingdom of God first. And that's really the heartbeat of what I have on I want to share today is seek the kingdom of God first. Will you rededicate your life to that purpose? Will you, it's not that you need to necessarily change everything that you do. We maybe just need to see what we do through a different lens and offer it back to God. And, and the interesting thing about this idea of putting the kingdom first is that when you put the kingdom first, everything else falls into place. That's kind of what this verse is saying. The order of things matters live for the kingdom. So often we get distracted with our challenges, the problems in our lives, the difficulties we face. And the biblical response to that is, yes, you need comfort. Yes, you need the strength. But by getting your priorities right, by taking your focus off yourself and on to God, you actually bring health and restoration to the other areas of your life. Put the kingdom of God first. Uh, getting things in order really matters. Just a, a brief story. We, in the summer, we were getting some work done in our house, and one of the jobs was going to uh, get a TV put up on the wall and get the cables in so that it was out of the way. And, and, and to do this, we needed three tradesmen to come in the right order. I know, a miracle, you're telling me. We had to get a joiner to come because um, the just because of the weight of the TV, we're not sure that the joists were going to hold it. We were going to get a, a, a kind of wooden panel put in behind. So he came in and did this. Now, the plan was that next the plasterer would come, fix over the huge mess that the joiner had made, uh, and, th and, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, wrong order. I've got the order wrong. The electrician was going to come next while it was a big mess, do all the electrics, get the so power socket up behind, and then, and then the plasterer was going to come and neaten it all up and make it all smooth. Now, could we get the three of them in the right order? No. The joiner shows up, apart from the fact that he put the wooden board in the wrong place for the TV, made a huge hole in our, our wall. Uh, thankfully, it was redeemable because we then discovered there was another place we could mount the TV, etc. Uh, and then the electrician didn't show up. And then uh, we had to get the plaster to come in, plaster it all, and then the electrician had to come. And thankfully, the electrician was able to work around it and didn't make a big mess. Anyway, my point is getting things in the right order <laughs> matters. And for us, the, 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 the call is to put the kingdom of God first in our lives, and you'll find that the other things start to work themselves out. Now, if we're a church that's going to thrive in this new area, I believe kingdom first has got to be a priority for us. As I think to the future uh, for our church, I'm excited about what God wants to do. I really honestly believe 2024 is going to be a significant year for us as a church. And I would, in I would invite you to join in praying with me into what that might look like. What has God got for us in 2024? But this is not a time for us to shrink back. This is not a time for us to be in self-preservation mode. This is a time for us to press onwards in bringing God's kingdom. So what I want to do now is just to pray for us, uh, to commission us effectively. If, if this morning you're sitting there and you're saying, God, I really, I really want to put your kingdom first today. And whatever it is, whatever stage of life you're in, whatever you do with your time, whatever you do with your energies, if you, today you just want to say, God, I give that to you and I want you to use it for your kingdom, then I'm going to invite you to respond and I want to pray over you. There's no pressure to respond today, but I, I feel like there is something about you making a, a, a literal stand. So if you today feel like the Lord 
you just want to commit yourself afresh to the Lord for his kingdom purposes, then I am going to invite everyone who wants to do that to stand, and then I'm going to pray and commission us uh, to, to go and bring God's kingdom. Um, so if that's you, um, I can't not look at you. You're going to have to be visible in this uh, situation. But if you want to be recommissioned uh, in, your, in your current season, then uh, I'd invite you to stand now. And just, uh, just settle your hearts before the Lord now and just offer up, uh, just bring to mind the things that you do, the things that are on your heart you want to offer to him. And then I just want to pray for us. God, I, I thank you so much that your kingdom is amazing. It's good and it's righteous and it's justice. And I thank you that you're working even now to bring your kingdom in East Lothian and beyond. And I thank you that you have a purpose for us as a, as a ecclesia, as a called out ones, to be kingdom ambassadors for you. And God, today we offer up our, all our productivity, all our vocation, all the things you call us to, God. We offer all of them up to you. And we say, God, use them for your kingdom purposes. And I pray that whatever work we do, that we would do it for you. God, just uh, I pray you would anoint us each by the power of your spirit to go and be the people you've called us to. I thank you that you don't just anoint the missionaries and the evangelists, God. I thank you that you anoint the, the business people and, and, and the workers and the shop workers and, and whoever else, God. You anoint us all in your name. So Spirit of God, come and anoint us now. Give us power to live for you. And I pray today, God, that we would feel sent in your power to go and be your people at this time. Give us a new lens on your kingdom to see it uh, in, in, with bigger eyes, with a bigger vision, God. Let's dream again, God. Let us dream again about how you're using us in what seem like the ordinary things, God. I thank you that with you, nothing is ordinary, that, that you infuse our lives. And, and I pray that as a church, we would be known for making your kingdom first. I pray that our eyes would be lifted off ourselves and onto your kingdom. And I thank you that you are king, God. Be king of our lives today. Amen.